My name is Gianni Russo, a.k.a. Carlo, the infamous son-in-law from The Godfather. I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather, and this is my story. Before all of the wins in my portfolio, I was a little boy diagnosed with polio, experimenting with cures. I tried every one, felt everything in my right, but my left was numb. Walking with a limp like, will I ever run? Once again, or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun. Some people were cool, but not everyone. You never know who you're lying in a room with. So I broke a broomstick in half and let it groove with the concrete in the bathroom floor. It had a new tip, stashed it behind the toilet in case I ever had to use it. Cause one day Dolores had a chat with me. Said she got word someone was coming after me. My heart started beating rapidly. Speak softly loud and hold me warm against your heart. I hear your words, the tender trembling moments. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Hollywood Godfather Podcast. And Pat is going to give you a little recap if you weren't tuned in last week, and I'm sure anybody that was tuned in last week is tuned in right now to hear the second part of this story. Pat, would you let our audience know who our great guest is, and probably, as we said last week, I mean, unbelievable, the story you had and lived. Yeah, our esteemed guest is uh, retired federal agent Joseph Acapente, who uh, told us in the first uh, uh, episode of this. This is the second episode about how how his investigation led to uh, him doing such a good job, basically, that a Dominican drug cartel had to get rid of him and killing a, a federal agent isn't the wise thing to do. So they did the next best thing, which was frame him for several federal crimes. And I imagine uh, Joe going into something like this when this investigation started, you figured you had nothing to worry about. You didn't do anything. Correct? Correct, Joe? Yeah. Yep. So uh, anyway, so but it, it now it reaches a, a, a fruition where he's indicted. And now you have to start to shake and sweat. And as I was telling our audience uh, uh, last week, this is when you, you and I met to discuss your case back in the day. Uh, so we're going to continue with the second episode. If you haven't uh, been introduced to Joe Acapinti, it's my honor and privilege to introduce him to you now. Uh, Joe, take it away from your from your indictment. Yeah. Well, you know, as a federal agent, you learn immediately when you're indicted. You understand the full ramifications of it. The mere fact that states, the United States of America versus, imagine your name. It takes you back. Uh, I knew all along the power of the Federation, but I didn't. I told my wife, well, we have to get competent attorney to okay, represent. Joe, wait, Joe, you have to understand something, too. There may be people that have not listened to the first episode of the show. Uh, the, the, the Federation, in, in, in like a the 10 words or less. It is, is, a, is a cartel, a Dominican cartel. According to the NYPD and published reports, the Federation was the political front of the Dominican drug cartel. Okay. And uh, while during our task force in increased enforcement efforts uh, on the bodegas in Washington Heights, many of them, which is was controlled by the Federation, out of outrage, they were able to convince the mayor uh, alleging that we violated their civil rights by doing unlawful searches and seizures. Now, well, when, you say, when you say uh, we, you were the only one indicted. Yeah, and, but there were 70 plus officers present on the search when they gave verbal permission and written yeah. permission to search. And they didn't what, stand by you what, as witnesses? Yes, they were. And uh, what we later learned was the... U.S. Attorney's Office, their investigators interviewed every agent, every police officer who were present on the search, all of whom admitted I got lawful permission, including the Internal Affairs Bureau, who was with uh, us on one of the searches, 
and had a tape recorder going where you could overheard me get permission. Now, what made this case unique is the fact it's not uncommon for criminals who are arrested or items contraband seized to allege an unlawful arrest and seizure. It happens every day. It it's, happened to me. But the cases are handled administratively in the court under the exclusionary rule. Basically, if the judge feels it was an unlawful search or arrest, they simply throw out the case. I became the first law enforcement officer in American history to be charged criminally because of an allegation of an unlawful search and seizure. What the bad guys alleged was they didn't sign the consent form until after the fact, which makes no sense. Mm. Because normally when you get arrested, <laughs> you want your lawyer, you're not going to say anything. It just didn't make any sense. It, it, it's, it's, you know, just, just to clear it up with the people who might not understand the, uh, the legal end of this, what they're alleging is they didn't sign a consent form until after you found the drugs that are going to send them away. And now they say, Okay, now I'll sign a consent form to make that you search got legal. It. You what? got it. I mean, I mean, how, I how, mean how, did the, how did the court swallow this? Well, I, was it a jury trial? or just? A it was a jury trial, but I will explain to you later on uh, a revelation that, that will explain this particular question you have, and it's a valid question. Uh, so when I found out I was... Indicted. I was involved in many Italian American organizations, and uh, uh, it was suggested that I reach out to Rudy Giuliani because oh, Rudy Giuliani <laughs> was was well aware of what I did in the Dulce case, and he agreed to meet with me. And he was not the U.S. attorney at that time when I was indicted, and he looked at it and he said, "This is garbage." He said, "It's garbage." He said, "But." I can't represent you because I was in the U.S. attorney at the time you started this particular project. So he sent me to the chief of the criminal division, a uh, former chief of the criminal division, who uh, agreed that this was BS and agreed to represent me for $75,000, $150,000, but wanted $75,000 up front. And I was kind of my, my wife said, look, Joe, we have a house. I don't know what oh. the equity is in the house. Let's get a second mortgage on the house and uh, we'll do it. We need a good attorney to represent you. So You're married to a saint, Joe. <laughs> so at, what happened <laughs> is at that point, I learned out who the U.S. attorney assigned to the case talking about conflict of interest he was one of the us he was one of the prosecutors who was assigned to project bodega and also project esquire who declined to prosecute the in-house uh uh counsel for the drug cartel plus yeah. what i find out is the judge he has is brought out of retirement he was the former, her former law clerk and her alleged godmother, you know, like a rabbi, a godmother, right. you know, a right. symbolic that they socialize and she was always taking care of him. And so so I didn't have a chance. So when. Uh, but this wasn't purpose, brought out into the trial, didn't you? It was. Mystery? It was. Oh. And uh, we're getting to the point. So when uh, when I got the when that attorney agreed to represent my case for 150, he called that particular prosecutor who immediately got the judge to have a hearing. And he alleged that Joe Arcapitti was a bail risk, likely to abscond and therefore put a lien on my house. So you I was couldn't a federal that. agent for 20 some odd years. I wasn't going anywhere. I was going to assert my innocence. I got uh, all, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, family relationships. I was not by no means a male risk. So what happened is we applied 
We were denied the mortgage because there was a lien on the house by the U.S. government. So I end up finding another criminal defense attorney who's willing, who I had, I knew from prior cases, and he agreed to handle my case for $30,000 or $25,000. So what happened is a week or two weeks before the trial, the attorney calls me, the new one, and he says he has to speak to me. It's very important. I said, what's wrong? He said, I've had a nervous breakdown. I can no longer represent you. Oh, my God. And if you don't believe me, get on the phone and speak to my psychiatrist. I spoke to the psychiatrist. He said, yes, he's my client, and I've directed him to be hospitalized. He needs it. There's no way he can represent you in trial. So, so, your got, opinion so they got to everybody. So, so what's, your, said, what's your take on this? That that statement that he I know he was, listen, he, he was literally had psychiatric problems. Okay. Oh, okay. The next so I told him you have to tell the judge. So the next day he goes into the court and he tells the judge, look, I've had a breakup of my law office. I don't have a law office. I've had a nervous breakdown. The judge says, I don't believe you. Oh, God. <laughs> so I went through trial with an attorney that would cry in open court, oh, God. bang his head against the wall, attempted to commit suicide twice, backed up police reports. <sighs> what? And, the, and, and this went forward? And I mean, it went forward. And, and he was acting like this in full court. Yes. And the judge would say, Mr. 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 M, you have to uh, compose yourself. Go take a break for coffee. He would caress me. And, but, <laughs> but here's what happened. This was my strategy. When I found out I was indicted, I realized I had to show the jury that these were bad guys engaged in ongoing criminal activity. So people in the community that I helped came forward voluntarily to be my informants, to go in and make undercover buys into every bodega, every prosecution witness who testified. That's a good strategy. And they succeeded in doing it. And we and? had something like 57 tapes. But the strategy was they were going to be what they call impeachment tapes. That means John Doe takes the stand and says, hi, I'm law abiding. I'm not engaged in criminal activity. That point, you can then impeach their credibility and show the jury that they perjured themselves. But what happened is my attorney meets me one day. He says, I got great news for you. I said, what's the matter? What's the great news? And I had my father up from Florida and my wife was there. He said, you know, the prosecutor really is trying to help you. I said, he's the enemy. He's not trying to help me. He said, but I told him about the secret tapes. Oh, oh my God. So the very next day, the prosecutor goes to his godmother and says, I want those tapes. And at this point, I'm doing all the arguing. My, my, my attorney was a basket case. And I said, Your Honor, I said, these are impeachment tapes. They're not discovery tapes. Nope. You got to turn them over. So for the week or so that they put their witnesses on, they had the tapes. I didn't even have duplicates. And when I tried to, twice... To bring it up and impeach their credibility, my my attorney was held in contempt of court, and that's oh, when, that must have helped them. And that's <laughs> the second time he tried. Well, the second time he tried to kill himself. Uh, yeah. but in any in any case, I never had a fair trial. But here's the revealing fact: I was convicted, and uh, I later learned in an in a national television documentary in my case they interviewed the jury foreman and they said why did you convict dr pinty 
And he said, he worked for the New York Times. He said, uh, well, we didn't believe any of what they said, but we were led to believe by the prosecutor that he's an immigration officer and therefore has no authority to arrest for narcotics, okay. which is not the law. You're a cop. <laughs> yeah. Which is not the law. So the jury misunderstood the law in the charging it. So when we, okay, oh, let me ask you this. Now. Did the judge, was it a bad charge to the jury? Yes. I say it was, and that was the interpretation of our charging of the, to jury. the jury. Yeah, yeah. That they believed I, I worked out of the scope of my authority as an immigration officer. That's enough for an appeal. <laughs> well, it is. It's enough. It's not going to say it's going to work. All right. So <laughs> during this trial... Uh, the judge found out through my attorney who told the prosecutor that Joe Acapinti went to 60 Minutes with all the evidence. I went to Chris Morgan, who you know. I know Chris. Who was an investigative reporter for CBS. He looked at the evidence and he said, you were railroaded. I said, I know, Chris. He said, I'm bringing you over to 60 Minutes, the producer. So when the judge found out I was going to be interviewed by 60 Minutes, she put a gag order on me. Oh, God. So I couldn't do it. I was boxed in. But here is what, what, what happened. After I was convicted, uh, I hired another attorney, of course, to do the appeal under ineffective assistance of counsel. I had the Actual medical records. I had the psychiatric record. Again, 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 for our audience, when you were convicted, what was the conviction, and what what were you facing? As far as uh, I was facing uh, up to sixty months. Okay, so uh, five years. What the yeah? Well, what because happened? They, there, the prosecutor was was pushing for sixty months. But the lower of the scale of the uh, sentencing guidelines was 37 months. But here's the point. Basically, what the conviction was for, they said, I did an illegal search that I saw that the people signed it after the fact that uh, uh, on my report, I said it was a consensual search. They said that was a lie and that I conspired, conspiracy. I was the sole defendant out of 70 people. <laughs> How long was the trial? I would say about three weeks. That's a long trial. Okay. I'm going to take a break. We'll be right back. Hold that thought. Don't go nowhere. We know where you live, man. I'm really excited to announce Pala Casino Spa and Resorts in California. The phone number for reservations is 760-510-5100. I'll be there one night, October 1st, a Saturday night. Come and catch the show. It's an evening you can't refuse. And I guarantee you, when you leave, you will be amazed at what you're going to see. Remember... Pala Casino and Spa and Resorts, 760-510-5100, October 1st. My way. All right, we're back from a commercial. The conclusion of this story is <laughs> totally, I mean, the, the biggest, I, I don't even know how to describe it. it, it this is all the being biggest in our Look, courts. This no, is but, the biggest miscarriage of justice I have ever seen. You know, uh, point after point after point goes in favor of the defendant, and they're either, they're either gagging him, not allowing him to change attorneys, uh, uh, how did the uh, uh, the uh, uh, appeal go? And he, uh, 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 you're saying that the counsel was ineffective. Well, yeah. they they uh, the day this is very important. The day of the oral arguments, 
the three the day of the oral arguments, my wife and I came into court and we heard a commotion, protesters. And then I looked closer. It was the Domini it was the Federation marching, saying that if the Acapinti conviction was overturned, they would riot in Washington Heights. The security people got me and told me not only were the protesters there, but several bomb threats were made that intimidated the uh, uh, the three uh, p judges on the Court of Appeals. And I put together an appendix of over 750 pages of evidence uh, talking about the ineffective assistance of counsel, the illegal turnover of those tapes that impeach the credibility. And, uh, you know, usually um, the judges reserve their decision, you learn a week or two weeks later. On the way home on 1010 Winds Radio, I heard that my conviction was upheld in less than two hours, which is unheard of. Wow. Because they were fearful that there was going to be riots in Washington Heights, which happened a couple of months later in yeah. Washington Heights. Well, that, that that's that's typical of politicians. I mean, but if, if you're on the, uh, on the wrong end of the stick here, this must have been. I mean, the the, the what you must have been going through psychologically must have been debilitating. So now you now you're on your way to jail. The, the appeal is gone. Where did they send you, and for how long? Well. Uh, Phil, I was supposed to, I, I was sentenced to 37 months, and I was supposed to go to a, a prison camp in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. And I got a phone call from Phil Caruso. I had a PBA. Head of the PBA. And he said, Joe, I'd like you to go on a new nation, national show called the Jackie Mason Show. And I said to him, Jackie Jack Mason's Jackson. a comedian. He's a comedian. <laughs> he said, no, Joe, he's a very serious guy. I think the name of his sh uh, new show is Politically Correct. And he said, I think you should go there. And I did. And they sent the car to pick me up and my three daughters. And we went. And uh, while we were in the audience, they got on the subject of the war on, cr uh, war on drugs. And that's when I got up and I, I said, look, uh, I'm a federal agent. I took on a drug cartel implicated in the murder of a police officer. I did my job and I've become the first law enforcement officer in American history to be charged criminally but for an allegation job. of an unlawful search and seizure. And there was silence in, in, in the audience. And Jackie Mason was taken back. And, uh, you know, it, it was painful. But what happened, by the time I got home from the studio, the U.S. Marshal left a note on my door and said, call me important. So I called the Marshal. He said, Joe, we know that you went on the Jackie Mason show. The judge is pissed off. Well, I assume the prosecutor might have said something to her and she immediately revoked my bond, revoked my ability to to uh, self-surrender. Was that in violation of the gag order or did you just pull it for the hell of it? No, the, once I was convicted, there was no gag order. Okay. In fact, after I was convicted, I went to Mike McAlary a Pulitzer Prize winner of the New York Post, who's exposed police corruption. Yeah, he did the Dirty 30. He did all the... Uh, That's yeah. right. Yeah. And like I said, he did in my book, front page for three days straight, the framing of a cop. He mentioned all the names of everyone who set me up and how the Federation manipulated many of these elected officials to to railroad me into a conviction. Let me ask you a then question, Joe. What happened inside edition reached out to me 
And Inside Edition wanted to go undercover with a new set of informants. And lo and behold, they went into the same bodegas, the same people who had me convicted that I was going to jail for. And on national TV, after, you know, how they the camera approaches them and then confronts them and yeah, said, yeah. it was your testimony that convicted a federal agent, right? And he said, yes. And they said, you, are you engaged in criminal activity? No. Well, take a look and shows him the camera. Yeah. And he's the, the name, uh, I think John Wasley was the producer, says, and you lie. You lie. Your perjured testimony convicted a federal agent. And on national TV, he said, yes, that's true. And what became of that? It was ignored by the Department of Justice. How long did you do? 37. Uh, well, my sentence was 37. And I ended up doing uh, seven and a half months in the general prison population. Wow. In fact, Any problem? Well, Bob, that's what when, I was going to say. Why did they take you out in the prison and end it all? Well, when we, we arrived, we were sent, I was sent to El Reno, Oklahoma, which is a maximum security prison for violent criminals. And while I was in the cages, the intake, they had the TV going for the guards. And a couple of inmates says, hey, that's you. You're the, you're the immigration guy. So immediately... I, I identified myself to the correction officer and he took me out. He said, we never got notification. We, that's protocol. Someone was out to hurt you. Hello. So they put me into solitary confinement, I think for 10, 11 days or something thereabouts, where I stopped eating, I uh, started to uh, uh, dehydrate. And they had to hospitalize me. And then they sent me to a medical center. And then they put me in a general prison population. In fact, that pro that the nephew, there? yes, yeah, I was going to tell you. In fact, the nephew of Freddie was there. And that's what I thought I was going to get hurt. And I'm walking around the compound. And there was a couple of Italian uh alleged organized crime who called over and I thought they were going to start a fight with me. They said, Hey, you, you're the Italian kid. You're the Brooklyn kid, the Fed. And I said, yeah, what about it? And they said, you got F by your own government, right? And I said, yeah. And uh, they said, do you know how to play bocce ball? And I said, yes, I used to play with my grandfather in Brooklyn. And these mobsters were from Detroit. And uh, they said, well, you stay with us, kid, and we'll protect you. Wow. Wow, that's, that's big. Impressive. That's impressive. Yeah, because to me, I'm shocked that, you know, that, that you're even talking to us, that you're alive. <laughs> well, there were two things that I think saved it. The more publicity, in my case at that time, basically... Uh, gave me protection because any because if they whacked me with all that publicity, it would only have confirmed what I. It might have put more heat on them, yeah. because what I learned was I had the unprecedented support of every major police organization in the country. Mine was a landmark case, and as a result of what happened to me. The Drug Enforcement Administration, the Port Authority Police, and many other police departments nationwide stop drug interdiction. The reason is when you do drug interdiction, you're operating on consent searches. And that's these what agencies, you got convicted on. <laughs> that's right. So these agencies did not want to put their people in harm's way. So as a result of that, many people came to my aid, including Staten Island Borough President Guy B. Molinari. Oh, yeah. Good guy. Uh, yeah. No guy. The National FOP, Tommy Scotto from NAPO and the DEA, and, and the lists go on and on. In fact, when mail call came, 
I literally got almost 100 letters a night from cops and federal agents and everyone that was sympathetic. Uh, the, the thing that broke my heart was, you know, after a while you think maybe you're forgotten. And I believe it was Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve. And this is when I was told that President uh, uh, Bush. Bush was going to grant me executive clemency, or I thought it was going to happen. Uh, I get a call uh, from my wife, and she's crying. And I realized she was crying because it's Christmas, you know? Right. This was the yeah. first time we were ever separated. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I just had Phil Caruso and the entire executive board come from New York to where I lived in New Jersey to bring my kids Christmas gifts. Wow. I said, wow, I was not an NYPD cop. I was a federal agent. But yet, they never forgot me because they felt maybe I got involved in this whole thing because of my investigation of Officer Bushak, who was killed by the drug lords I was investigating. But the point was, it was at that point things were changing. And then I got the clemency. And uh, I went on a national speaking tour around the country telling them what was happening. And uh, at that point, uh, I even took the chance with all the newly discovered evidence I had of the drug cartel conspiracy, all of which was compiled by Mr. Molinari that was entered into the congressional record so everything I'm saying now is sworn affidavits, undercover tapes, entered into the congressional record in published reports. And uh, I tried for congressional hearings, and it never materialized. I don't want to mention the guy's name, but he, every time I tried to push for it, when I finally did testify before Congress, he said, this man has no credibility. He's a convicted felon. Oh, so he tried God. to diminish me and what I was saying because I was a convicted felon. Where did uh, uh, President Trump uh, come into the picture? Here? Yeah. Uh, many of the law enforcement agent organizations continued to lobby the White House for a full and unconditional presidential pardon. Like it never happened. My, yeah, and my congressman uh, called me and said, I just got off the phone with President Trump uh, and I got a great Christmas gift for you. It's uh, President Trump granted you a full and unconditional presidential pardon. But more importantly, he apologized for the injustice that you had to endure for the and last how many 30 years. For our audience, how many years after that did Trump, you know, exonerate? 31 years. How many? 31 years. Oh, my God. Joe, I mean, I, 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 I know I speak for Gianni when I say this, but uh, you lived the tragedy and we feel for you. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've known you a while, but the way you told your story, you're an excellent storyteller. And to tell a story, you have to relive it all, you know, and oh we, God, we yeah. appreciate you so much for coming on the air and hope and pray that this never, ever happens to, to another law enforcement officer. Uh, uh, can we uh, uh, announce this book for our audience to go get this book? Of course. Book? Let's, yeah, let's talk about your book a little, Joe. Well... What happened is a lot of it goes into further de detail what I spoke about, about some of the major investigations I had and, and, and how successful they were up to the day that my problems began investigating the cartel implicated in the murder of police officer Bushak. But then it also talks about uh, how two years after getting the executive clemency from President Bush. And I realized it was not going anywhere, that I had too many 
adversaries in Congress that didn't want to expose this, what happened to me. Uh, and uh, uh, I said, it's time to move on. I said, uh, it's time to move on. But I want to be able uh, to help other good law enforcement officers who may have found themselves in a position. And I established the National Police Defense Foundation, never uh, imagining that today we're over 210,000 members and supporters nationwide and in 12 foreign countries. Now, you lost your pension, too, right? Once you got to- No, uh, my job took care of me. I, I did get my pension. Good. And I'm a volunteer. I don't get paid for what I do in the foundation. But for the last 26 years, as the executive director and founder of the foundation, we literally uh, won so many cases against dedicated law enforcement officers who are falsely, accu falsely accused, including uh, officers charged with first degree murder. But there's another aspect. I wanted to also do, I was outraged by the increased armed assaults and, and assassinations of police officers. And I started the Safe Cop program with a group in the organization. When a cop gets shot anywhere in the United States, or even you point a gun at a policeman or law enforcement officer, we post a $10,000 reward leading to the arresting conviction. But another important program, which has given my life legacy, let's call it, is the humanitarian work that I love to do. While I was a federal agent, I was very much involved in human trafficking of children, being sold on the black market, used in the sex trade. And I started Operation Kids. And in the last 20 plus years, we brought in critically ill children from all over the world for life-saving operations. And it wow. projects a positive image of police. Of as, I, as, you, as you read, I was even asked to meet with president, uh, with uh, two presidents, uh, two uh, popes, the most recent Pope Francis, who I had a long conversation with, who thanked me for, uh, for uh, my efforts on Operation Kids. And who was so the first one? This book, John so Paul? This book, what? Who was the first Pope? John Paul? Uh, uh, Benedict. Oh, okay. And I liked him because his father was a police sergeant in Germany. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, in life, a legacy is so important to you. I think I, how would I say it, you know? I didn't do too bad for a kid from Brooklyn. I became I mean, one of the most what decorated. You've done, though, I mean, just to go through, I mean, I mean, I can only sympathize with you and your family and your wife. I mean, you're talking about 41 years waiting for a clemency from Trump. That that's nuts. The the well, sorrow and the hurt. It's uh, horrible. Uh, because, it's horrible because we see what's happening today. Oh my God! The police. Yeah. There's such an anti-police sentiment out there. The country is divided 50-50. And my heart goes out for the young cops that are out there now. They're family men. I'm they surprised they're even getting them. on the they job. They don't want to put themselves in my situation. You know? You know, uh, uh, prior, prior to you telling us uh, the horrors that you went through, you were a highly decorated federal officer. I mean, they, they don't even take that into consideration. They don't say, how could somebody like this turn I mean, this is common sense. It was just <laughs> that that's that's the point I tried to make. In the 22 years of government service I had, I had never one discipline action against me ever. You know, every uh, arrest and seizure I had, the, maybe for an exceptional one or two, was found by the courts to be lawful. Now, no one just comes out after 22 years and, and starts doing speech. what they're alleging. Of but I, I want to put into context what I was convicted for. They simply said it was a piece of paper. People said, well, you went to jail, what for? A piece of paper. 
That's they claim tradition. it's their signature, but they don't recall when they signed it. It's, it's bogus. Yeah, so let's it's lock bogus. the top up. Yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, well, I, I've, I've had a colorful life in so many ways, and we all, in our own way, had tragedies. But what you have gone through, first of all, your accolades, like Pat's just mentioned, your decorations prior, your service to this country, and then to be treated this way. And no one, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how they just had that, the Federation and that kind of power to corrupt our whole judicial system, and they let it go. Well, what I learned in one of the last chapters, it's called Revelations. And I'm not a conspiratorial guy, but according to many sources uh, and published reports, it wasn't only the Federation's, uh, you know, that was out to get me. Uh, what I learned was that 10 other criminal investigations by other federal agencies, including the FBI, DEA, IRS, Postal Inspection Service, was ordered, terminated, not to investigate them. I actually have government documents. So who has that kind of clout to terminate viable criminal investigations? So I stepped on someone's foot in addition to the Federation. Who's the Attorney General while all this is going on? Uh, Remember? I think William Barr. Well, there had to be a couple of them, not just one. Yeah. 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 Well, I, yeah. But I, I mean, I mean, the, the, the time the investigation Janet was Reno, going on. Because I knew yeah. it was Janet Reno when they sent her the video of the jury foreman stating that the only reason they convicted us, they misunderstood the law that an immigration officer couldn't arrest for drugs. Yeah. Look at the southern border, what they're arresting for. Yeah. Tons of drugs. Yeah. Wow. But look, it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, life is, I have several regrets, and I beat myself up every day. Well, you shouldn't have any. myself, yeah, I should have been a smarter guy. No, but I, I mean, should have put, reviewing I should have put your life now, first. look what you have. To me, I mean, I, I, I've met a lot of people in my life. My hat's off to you, man. The fact that you have your sanity going through something like this, and really, and I don't, I don't hear any animosity even. You, you're, yeah. you're, you're just a nice guy and making excuses for all these idiots for what they did to you, basically. Uh, you know, <laughs> Joe, if, I allow it to, if I allow it to consume me, then I'm no good for my family. Anymore. Well, I know, and that's what the, that's exactly what I'm going to wind up like your lawyer. But that's <laughs> the kind of man you are. That's what. That's what. It's, I'm glad we had could shed a little light on your life and who you really were. And thank you for the privilege. Believe me, I yeah, never thought emotionally and and I mean, it has an effect on me. I'll tell you that because I'm a very yeah, sensitive person, and for what you went through after giving all the loyalty and service to your job. And uphold the law, they 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 convicted you with their own laws you were trying to protect. Yeah. I know, but uh, oh. I I uh, as I'm I'm now in my what they call golden years. Uh, How old we, are you? We, you don't mind me asking. I, I I felt it was important that I'm, I'm I had you to did. tell my story. I had to tell my story. No, your grandchildren alone, and, like you're saying. And at least I may have not won in a court of law, but in a court of public opinion. No. No, you want to eradicate any negativity. I'm glad that book is going to do it for you. That's, that's it. And you have, you, you, have, you have not one president, but two presidents. I mean, you're totally vindicated. And uh, not that you needed it because you were innocent to begin with, but it certainly helps. And... Uh, you know, we wish you peace, Joe. Yeah. You know, just peace. Joe, how old that's, are you, that's... if you don't mind me asking? I'm se I just turned 72. Wow. Amazing. And I'm married 50 years. God bless. God bless her. And her she, is a, 
She is the true hero. And my children were the true hero. How many children do you have? I have three daughters and six grandchildren. God bless. And uh, it, it was important for them to know, my grandchildren, oh my what God, really yeah. happened. And I tell them, the criminal justice system often makes tragic mistakes. And unfortunately, it's not supposed to be police work. It's not supposed to be politically charged or right. you know but it is what it is today and uh and i but have see, a son even, even your attitude right now you, you somewhat you're still defending the law i love it you're an amazing man i'm so I happy have, have been a lot I, have, of I have one regret my i loved what i did in customs and i should have never transferred to an agency that was underfunded and had the stigma of being a racist. At least with customs, it was a treasury department, well-funded, and it had an important role in the war on drugs. And that's what I tried to do to immigration. Right. Forget about arresting a simple illegal alien. That's not the way to go. Use your authority. Use your efforts in getting the bad guys. And in my book, you'll see, I got, I'm, I actually went after terrorists effectively, drug cartels, uh, human traffickers. And that's where we should be focusing on. But again, today, it's, it's a lot difficult. Your and hands the name are is got framed. I want our audience to know. It's framed, it's right? Framed. I never stood a chance. And, wh and, where, and where, where, can, where is it available? It's yeah. in Amazon, in Barnes and Noble, in uh, Walmart, or simply call my office. It's a simple phone number. Wow. What's eight, the phone number? Eight 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 Safe Cop. I we'll love it. Eight 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 Safe Cop. Yeah, and my staff I, can help you. I urge everybody who uh, really uh, believes what they read in, in, in the media to pick up this book. And uh, perhaps you'll have some sympathy for the individuals, both men and women, who do this job and could be the next Joe Acapinti just because some politician wants to cover their own ass. Uh, Thank you, Joe, for, for, for sharing this with us. That's a great way to end the show. I mean, this is, is you have exhausted me, <laughs> but in a good way. I mean, I mean, you stand out amongst very few human beings to do what you've done. I mean, you know, the definition. Those kind words. Thank you. No, the definition. Uh, I, I've often mentioned this on the show because I, I teach uh, on a university level, and you hear the word hero being bandied about a guy th throws a football he's a hero and it really upsets me because i've known a lot of heroes joe and you're one of them yeah man. thank you risk you risk your life and that's the definition of a hero wow. for the welfare of others and uh not too many people impress me uh, but you do thank you very much for your service no, thank have a good you. night thank, thank you. you god bless you and okay. your family okay. <laughs> If you're feeling sad and lonely, there's a service I could render. I'm the one who loves you only. I could be so warm, so tender. Call me. Don't be afraid, you can call me. Maybe it's late, but Thank just Thank you call for tuning me. in to the Hollywood Tell Godfather podcast. You can contact Gianni Russo, Patrick Picciarelli, or myself, Megan Horan, with your questions and comments through the contact section of our website, hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com which is where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can also call and leave us a message at 646-776-3038. Remember to follow us on Instagram at Hollywood Godfather and on Facebook, as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd like to know what you'd like about what we're doing, what you'd like to hear in the future, and anything else you might suggest to improve our podcast. Most importantly, hit the subscribe button. We'll be back next week with stories of the mob and Hollywood, as well as answers to your messages. Good night. Call me. Don't be afraid. You can call me. 
maybe it's late, but just call me. Tell me and I'll be around. I'll be around. It was a very good year It was a very good year For small town girls And soft summer nights We'd hide from the light On the village green I didn't mind 